we're starting a new series uh, called Collision, and we're going to be talking about this all the way up till Easter and even past Easter, how the cross of Christ collides with everything. Each week will be a, a different topic, and, and it will be a different thing that the cross collides with. Today we're going to talk about how the cross collides with the law, or how grace collides with the law. It's the subtitle of today's sermon is Grace versus the law. And there was a huge collision between grace and the law when Jesus came and ultimately died on the cross for our sins. And we're going to look at a lot of scripture today. We're going to look at uh, a lot of points about that today. We're going to do our best to be clear with everything today, and, uh, but we're, we're definitely going to need the Lord's help with that. So if you would, would you just pray with me real quick as we get started? Father, we love you and we thank you. And uh, Lord, as I just mentioned, this is a big topic. Father, there are so many scriptures that we will not have time to explore. There are so many angles and avenues into this topic that we will not have time to unpack. Uh, but Lord, I just pray that your spirit would move in this place. I pray for great clarity and uh, Father, I just pray that you would speak into the lives of your people about the differences between the law and grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You don't have to look very far in the New Testament to discover that Jesus and the Pharisees and the Sadducees had this collision happening throughout his ministry, this collision between the law and grace. I want to give you just a few examples, uh, certainly not an extensive list here, but, but a few examples, uh, like Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 and 11. And you don't have to try to flip to, to all of these, because we're going to move through them really quick. But here's what it says. It says, while he was reclining at the table, Jesus, in the house, uh, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And of course, Jesus has a very good answer to that question, but it's not the subject of today. But I just want you to see there's this collision between the law and grace, these religious people saying, why are you breaking the law by eating with tax collectors and sinners? And ultimately, Jesus' answer is grace. Matthew 12, 1 and 2 is another example. It says, at that time, Jesus passed through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And by the way, many of the clearest examples of this collision between the law and grace, between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day, happened around the Sabbath and the idea of the Sabbath. It was one of the main laws that they were the most intense about. It goes on to say, his disciples were hungry and they began to pick and eat some heads of grain. So they're just walking through a field, picking a few heads of grain and eating it while they walk. And the Pharisees, verse 2, saw this and they said to him, see, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. You're breaking the law. Matthew 12, 9 and 10, another example, says, moving on from there, he entered their synagogue and there he saw a man, the shriveled hand, and in order to accuse him, they asked him, is it lawful, because his ministry is colliding over and over again, the ministry of grace is colliding with the law of these spiritual leaders, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And if you jump down to verse 13, you'll see it says this, then he told the man, stretch out your hand, so Jesus decides to heal him. So he stretched it out, it was restored as good as the other, but the Pharisees didn't rejoice. The Pharisees didn't jump up and down. The Pharisees did not get on their knees and worship Jesus and say, you are indeed the Messiah. No, what do they do in verse 14? But the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might kill him. Because grace is colliding with their law. Matthew 15, 1 through 3 then Jesus was approached by Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem who asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders, the law? For they don't wash their hands when they eat. And he answered them, why do you break God's commandment because of your tradition or your law? You see the collision? Grace versus the law. 
It's not a new thing. It's not just a thing for us. It was a thing that happened in Jesus' time. It's ultimately the thing that leads him to the cross. And it is the ultimate example, the cross that is, the ultimate example of the collision between grace and the law. Paul had to face it in his own ministry. You would think that after Jesus died on the cross, this debate would have been over, but it wasn't. We see it in the life of Paul and Peter and many others who go on to write epistles and who go on to do the work of God. We see an example in Acts 18, verse 13, where it says, this man, they said, is persuading people to worship God. And that's a good thing, right? To persuade people to worship God, you would think that's good. No, not for these guys, because he is persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. They love the law. They're keeping the law. They're holding on to the law. Even after Jesus has died on the cross for their sins. And the truth is this, church, even today this is still happening. Even today, even in the life of the church, even in the life of Christians, there's, there's still this collision, this conflict, this friction between the law and between grace. And I think the primary reason for that is most people don't really know what to do with either. Most don't know what to do with the law, and most don't know what to do with grace. There's basically two different kinds of people in the world when it comes to the law and grace. The first is those who believe grace totally ended and totally nullified the law. In other words, that Jesus came, died on the cross, and so now the law is useless, the law is nullified, the law is no longer valid. And they'll cite verses like Romans 6.14, which says, for sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. And that's true, right? Amen? That's true. I mean, it's scripture. It can't be wrong. Or Romans 10.4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Amen. That's true, right? You're following me? Galatians 5.18 is just yet another example, a quick example of many others we could look at. But Galatians 5.18 says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're saved, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, it says you are not under the law. Amen. That's good. That's true. That's truth. The second group says the law is still in effect, and the law um, is in effect to various degrees. There's subcategories of this group we don't have time to explore and look at, but there are people who say, you know, the the law isn't totally nullified, and the law isn't totally gone. And they have scripture too, by the way. (laughs) Scriptures like Romans 3.31, which says, do we then nullify the law through faith? Do we nullify the law because of our faith in Jesus? And his answer, Paul's answer, is absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So that has to be true too in Scripture. Or Matthew 5, 17, Jesus himself, guys, said this. If we're just going to cut to the quick of it, we could give a lot of other examples. But if we're just going to cut to the heart of it, Jesus says, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. I didn't come to abolish it or nullify it, I came to fulfill it. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law. This is Jesus. Until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So we're left with this question. What is it? Which is it? The law or grace? The answer, I think, is yes. (laughs) It's kind of a cop-out, but it's the truth. The answer is yes. But you have to have a proper understanding of both and what their purpose is and why they're both still realities for our lives. 
I think on the onset, the, the basic thing we have to understand, and the basic thing most Christians today don't understand is this. The law was never intended to be a means of salvation for humanity. The law was never intended by God to be a way for you or, my, or myself or anybody else to be saved. God gave humanity the law to show them what his perfect standard looked like. He gave humanity the law to show them what it looked like to be holy and what it looked like to be righteous. He gave them the law so they could see how high the bar actually was. In effect, God wanted to show them that it was going to be impossible for them to ever jump over that bar or to reach the law, the level of the law. God always intended, and we, if we had time, we could go back and look at this, but God always intended that man would not find their salvation through the law, but that they would find their salvation through his grace. Even in the Old Testament, he wanted people to see through the law that they could not do it on their own, that they, they, they couldn't reach it, that they couldn't perfect it, that they would never be what the law required that it wasn't possible in their power, that it wasn't possible with their effort, that it wasn't possible with their money, that it wasn't possible no matter how much they studied or no matter how hard they tried. He wanted them to see that they would never find salvation in the law. The problem is religious leaders came along and they started interpreting the law. And they started saying, well, if you want to reach the law, you've got to do this and this and this. They started adding to the law. They put tradition on top of the law and many other things that got in the way. And over time, people started to pervert the law into this idea that that was indeed a means to salvation, which it was never intended by God to be. It was never supposed to be a way for people to be saved. It was supposed to be a way for people to see their sin and to go, you know what? God's grace is the only way I'm going to be forgiven of that sin. So when God sent Jesus as his representative of grace down to earth, he fundamentally changed the equation. He fundamentally changed the game. As Jesus himself proclaimed, he didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill it. He came to do what you and I would never be able to do. He came to leap over that bar of perfection that is impossible for us so that we would never have to do it. And in the process of fulfilling the law, he did what only God could do. He remained sinless. And he demonstrated what a perfect, holy, righteous life looks like in the flesh. And then, rather telling you and I, now you have an example, now you see that it can be done, go do it for yourself. Rather than doing that, he died on a cross so you would never have to do that. He offered his grace to you and to I so that we could be saved through that rather than any achievement of the law. So what I want to do today is very quickly point out five things, five differences that the law and grace have in common. Five collisions that happen with the law. I actually have a list of 15, but we don't have time for 15, so we're going to do five. Uh, I did want to tell you that I, I, I produce a daily devotional every day. It's four minutes long. It's a little audio or video uh, clip. It's called the Daily Devo. Some of you get it and know about it. I haven't mentioned it in a really long time. But this week, I'm going to be doing another thing, another five of these all week, Monday through Friday. And so if you want to get the continuation, um, they're going to put a QR code up here on the screen. You can get your phone out, scan it, put your email in, and it'll send you uh, those devotions each day. They'll leave it up there for a minute and maybe put it back up in a minute because we're going to get rolling here and we're going to move fast. Point number one is this. The law, the law reveals sin. Grace forgives sin. That's what the law does. The law reveals your sin and grace forgives your sin. As I mentioned a moment ago, a moment ago one of the major purposes of God's law and has always been the purpose of God's law is to point out our shortcomings and our sin in our lives. 
It was put there so we could clearly see that we are sinners, that we fall short of the perfection of the law, that we will never measure up to the standard of the law. And the only way we would ever find salvation was through great faith in God because we would constantly and consistently fall short of the law. Romans 7, 7 says, what should we say then? Is the law sin? Again, Paul says, absolutely not. But I would have not, he says, but I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. For example, I would not have known what it was to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. And sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind, Paul says. This is a confession. For apart from the law, sin is dead. In other words, and and there's many other examples of this in Scripture, but in other words, Paul is saying the purpose here of the law is to reveal sin in your life, and it did that for me. He said the reason I know what coveting is is because of what the law says about coveting. And the point there is simple. If it wasn't for the law, none of us would know what sin even is. We wouldn't even know of our need for salvation because there would be no law. So what God did is he interwove the law into everything. The law is interwoven into the DNA of creation. The law is interwoven into the DNA of our lives. The law is interwoven into everything around us. That's how we know the difference between what is righteous and what is unrighteous, what is holy and what is unholy, what is good and what is bad. Because we have an understanding of the law. The law's purpose is to reveal your sin. Grace, on the other hand, brings forgiveness for our sin. There's a difference in the two. And that's ultimately what we all need. Romans 5 says it like this. The law came along to multiply the trespass. In other words, again here, the law is there to point out your sin. But where sin multiplied, it says grace multiplied even more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The result of acknowledging your sin, the result of confessing your sin, the result of asking for forgiveness of your sin, the result of repenting of your sin, the result of receiving God's grace and salvation through Jesus Christ is the permanent eternal forgiveness of all your sins. Not just your past ones, not just your future ones, not just the ones from today, but all of them. The law reveals sin, grace forgives it. Number two, the law is a shadow, grace is the substance. The law is the shadow, grace is the substance. The law has always been a shadow of what was to come and what was to be through grace. Even in the Old Testament, the law was a way of God's people to experience God's grace and to know they needed to put their faith and their trust in him. I I love how Hebrews 10 puts it. Again, there's so many examples we could use, but but I, I love this one. Hebrews 10, 1 through 4 says, Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered? Since the worshipers purified once and for all would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in the sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins. Remember, it's there to point out your sin, to remind you of your sin. There is a reminder of your sins year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. In other words, he's saying it was never intended to be a means of salvation. It was intended to be a reminder that you're a sinner and that you need God and you need his grace and you can't get it on your own. It's a shadow. Grace is the substance. Look at Colossians 2.13. And when you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. Look at verse 14. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. 
He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. Therefore, he says, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or the matter of a festival or a new moon or Sabbath day. Those are all law things. These are a shadow, he says, of what was to come. The substance is Christ. The law is a shadow, but the substance is grace. The law is a shadow, but the substance is Christ. Number three, the law demands perfection. Grace offers acceptance. It's a great difference between the law and grace. The law will always demand your perfection. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus takes multiple opportunities to expand on the law. He doesn't take away the law. He expands on it. He broadens it. In one of those discussions, he's talking about how we should love our neighbors, and and he actually expands on that Old Testament law, that Old Testament idea, and he broadens it out quite a bit. Look at it here in the Sermon on on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 43. He says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same. And then look at verse 48. He says, be perfect... Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now he got real quiet in here (laughs) when I just read that. And that means you're listening. And you get it. And I have a feeling it got real quiet when Jesus said those words too. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. He says, you've heard the law. The law is love your neighbor, love them as yourself. He says, I'm going to go beyond that. I'm going to expand this. You're not just supposed to love your neighbor. You're supposed to love everybody. Even people who hurt you, persecute you, hate you, don't like you, you're supposed to love them. And then he ends with this incredible statement here of perfection. And the reason it gets so quiet when you read those words and you let them soak into your soul is because you know that's impossible. You know there's no way you can do that. (laughs) And that's what the law demands. The law demands your perfection. Grace, on the other hand, it's different. It offers acceptance. Again, many verses we could talk about, but let me just show you John 3, 16 through 18. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son, that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He said the word everyone. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Grace is very different from the law. Grace doesn't demand our perfection. It demands that we admit we're not perfect. It demands that we admit that we're sinners. Grace offers everybody a seat at the table. Grace offers everybody a place in God's kingdom if we repent, if we confess that Jesus is Lord. If we say we're not perfect and will never be without the help and the love and the mercy and the grace of God. The law demands your perfection Grace offers acceptance when you admit you're not perfect. Number four, the law emphasizes effort. Grace emphasizes provision. The law is all about your effort. It's not hard to see. It's not hard to understand. We know it's true. The law focuses on works. The law focuses on effort. The law focuses on production. The law focuses on your ability to reach that high standard, that high bar while grace, on the other hand, is the free, absolutely unearned gift of God for you. Look at what Galatians 2 says about the law and works and grace and God's provision. Galatians 2:15 through 16. 
We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And yet, because we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we ourselves have believed in Jesus Christ. This was so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no human will be justified. You can't be justified through the law. It's impossible. It's only through grace. In Romans 11, as a part of a much bigger discussion, Paul makes it very clear in verse 6. He says this, Now if by grace, then it is not by works, otherwise grace ceases to be grace. In other words, it's either grace or the law. You've got to pick, pick which one it's going to be. But it can't be both and for salvation. He says if it's grace, then it can't be about the law and works. And if it's the law, then it can't be about grace because they are too different. It's not that works have no part in our faith. James reminds us of that. He says that our faith without works is dead. Works do have a part in our faith, but the reality is works have no part in our salvation. Works have no part in us being secured with our eternal salvation. Grace emphasizes God's provision for all of us through Christ while works do just the opposite, and the law does just the opposite. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It says, for you are saved by grace through faith. And he makes it clear, this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. The law is always going to emphasize effort and ability and production and the more you do to try to reach that high standard. Grace is always going to emphasize God's provision in your life because you've already admitted you can't reach the high standard of the law. The last one is this, number five, the law enslaves, grace liberates. The law will never set you free. It just won't. It can't. Doesn't have the power to do it. The nature of the law is to enslave you. Galatians 3, 23 through 26, before this faith came, we were confined under the law. And confined is a strong word, but he uses even a stronger word next. He says imprisoned until the coming of faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for through faith you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. The law can't set you free, only grace can do that, but the law will enslave you. It's what happened to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's why even though the Messiah walked among them, it's why even though they talked to him on multiple occasions, they sat with him, they dined with him, they saw him do miracles, They still couldn't accept it because they were so enslaved and entranced by the law. Romans 7 points out another interesting reality for us. Look at it in verse 4. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another. You belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions aroused through the law were working in us to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law since we have died to what held us, what enslaved us, so that we may serve in the newness of the Spirit and not the old letter of the law. You see, the law will hold you captive. The law will enslave you. The law will put you in bondage if all you do is aim and try to make your life about reaching the pinnacle of the law. But grace, well, it does just the opposite. See, grace sets you free. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, For freedom Christ set us free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery, which is the law and sin. The law enslaves, grace liberates, and sets free. 
Church, if you reject Jesus, you are rejecting God's grace. If you say no to Jesus and turn your nose up at Jesus and turn your back on Jesus and reject Jesus, in effect, you are rejecting the grace of God. And you are putting yourself in a position where you will be judged by the law of God. You're putting yourself in an impossible position. A position that will not lead to salvation or eternal peace. Instead, it will lead to hell and eternal punishment. Because you can never reach the pinnacle of the law. You can never fulfill the law. You can never be made perfect by the law. You cannot be set free through the law. And so thus, you will die in your sins no matter how much of the law you're able to obtain or receive or fulfill during your life. You'll never fulfill all of it. If you never repent of your sins and accept God's grace through His Son Jesus, you'll die in the law. So my encouragement to you today would be to accept Jesus, to call on Him, to believe in Him, to confess Him as your Lord and Savior, and to be saved, not by the law, but through grace. The law was never meant to save you. Grace always was. I have an illustration I want to use today. It's an imperfect illustration, by the way. It's, it's not a perfect illustration at all. Um, and you're going to see why here in just a moment. It's imperfect in many ways. But I do think it's a helpful illustration. An illustration that will, will help us figure out how, how to picture this and make a little more sense of it. I'm going to need some help for this illustration um, I need somebody who is very athletic, in the prime of their life, not Leighton. Jason? Yeah? And, and this person is going to be your representative. He's going to be the representative of hu humanity. Who wants to do it? I've got to have somebody. It's going to be a long sermon. Oh, look at this guy. Oh, man, he's taking his clothes off. You don't have to take your shirt off. Just, oh, he's just taking his jacket off. Okay, good. He's going to be a, a representative for y'all, and uh, he's going he's to be a representative for all of us. Tell everybody your name. Alejandro. Alejandro. So Alejandro is going to be my, my helper. Anybody think they're more athletic than Alejandro? Anybody want to come up here and challenge him to a push-off contest or <laughs> something? Figure out, because we need the best of the best, the cream of the crop right here. Gerald, you want to come up here? Uh, oh, he's taking his cowboy hat off and jacket off. Okay, Alejandro's going to be the guy. Okay, now, I don't know if y'all noticed or not, but there's a ball up there. Have y'all seen that ball? Now, I haven't mentioned that ball. I haven't looked at that ball. I haven't talked about that ball. How many of y'all, though, have noticed the ball before I just mentioned it? All of y'all, good. That means you're alive and awake. That ball is, is like the law. The law doesn't have to be mentioned. It doesn't have to be pointed out for us to notice it. We can all see it. We all notice it. We all know it's there. And, and it's obvious. It sticks out like a sore thumb in the room, right? And, and Alejandro is down here on earth representing y'all. And here's why the, the illustration isn't perfect. I'm going to be God, okay? <laughs> the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God, that's going to be me, which... I'm going to do a horrible job at that, but I'm going to do my best, and y'all have good imagination. So just imagine for the sake of illustration. So I'm God, Alejandro's man. He's down here on earth, and I have put my law up there for Alejandro and for all of you to try to reach. Now, I need him to really try. You got a lot of try in you? Yeah. He's a pretty tall guy, pretty fit guy. I want to see if, if you can get up there and, and, and jump to the law. Now, to give you a little incentive, I'm going to tell you, in the bottom, you see that envelope? Okay, that is the representative of grace. And in that envelope is a $100 bill. And if you can get it, you can have that $100 bill. All right, would you like to have a $100 bill? Yeah. Y'all want him to get a $100 bill today? That's what I'm talking about. They are counting on you. Okay, all right. So go ahead, give it your best shot. Jump, Do, get a running start. You need to get a running start and try? Yeah, will that help? That's a pretty big run. Don't wear yourself out before you get here. Go ahead, give it your best. I'll move out of the way. 
Oh, so close. He's getting close, isn't he? And try again. Okay, now that's a good example, right? So he's, he's trying his best, and then all of a sudden, mankind comes along and says, you know what, he needs a little step up. He, he needs some help. And so they'll interpret the law and say, well, hey, if you just keep the Sabbath, if you keep the Sabbath, you'll have a better shot. Or if you follow this, or if you follow that, or if you don't do this, or if you do do that, or if you don't flip on a light switch, or if you blah, 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 whatever it is, then you're going to have a better shot at getting there. And so those are all stepping stones. Why don't you come up here on the second step? Or just go the third step. Yeah, go ahead, take a jump at it. Yeah, you got a big head start. Oh, you want to come all the way up here, get a, get a big, I mean, this is pretty high up. Maybe you'll be able to get it from here, right? No, oh, still can't get it. I think there's something wrong with this guy. I figured by now he'd have been able to get it. So he's figured out he can't get it by himself. Maybe you could get it with a helper. Maybe you could get a friend and put him on your shoulder and jump up there. You want to pick a friend and try that? Y'all could jump off this stage and try to get it? Maybe I'm playing the serpent now. You think that would help any? I need like three people. You need like three people? Well, try it. You got, we got time. We're all waiting on you. We want to see you get that $100 bill. So come, come back down here, Alejandro. So you don't think you can get it by yourself, huh? You know why I put that $100 bill in that ball up there? Again, I'm God. He's y'all. You know why I did that? Why? Because I wanted you to ask me for help. You want me to help you get that $100 bill? Yes. You want some grace? Yes. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. And this is also why this, this illustration is imperfect. My son is going to play Jesus. <laughs> He's not Jesus. So Jesus, bring out the cross of grace so we can get this man his $100 bill. Here he comes. Y'all give Peter a round of applause. And see, grace, grace comes out of nowhere when you least expect it into your life. I'll set this up. You want to pick it up? There you go. I'm going to set this up for Alejandro. Perfect. Right there. Now see, here's what I could do. I could make Alejandro climb that ladder and go get it himself. I could do that, but if he fell off, he'd probably sue me. <laughs> so we're not going to do it for that reason. Instead, I'm going to send my son and not only because I don't want to get sued, but because this is a better picture of the illustration. This is what God did. He didn't make you die on a cross. He didn't make you climb on the cross and die for your own sins. He sent his son. So go ahead, son, go up there and get it. Be very careful. All right, now come on down, careful. And now you got your $100 bill. That's right. <laughs> now, here's another reason this is an imperfect illustration, as somebody pointed out after the first service. If this was real grace, $100 bills would keep coming out of there. Because <laughs> God never runs out of grace. But uh, this is just an illustration. There's only $100 bill up there, all right? So, so Alejandro, you got your $100 bill. You can keep that. That's for you. We appreciate you. You can have a round of applause. Thanks for coming up. I'm going to put this ladder down real quick so everybody can see here for a second. But I hope that illustration helps you kind of visualize it and picture it. What the law is and what the law isn't, what the law can do and what the law can't, and what grace is. And what, the, what grace can do. And grace is the only hope you have. Grace is the only hope I have. Because we're never going to reach it by ourselves. We're never going to get up there. I don't care how big the stage is and how much you try to jump, because the law is a lot higher than that ball. 
It's impossible without the grace of God. I want to read this last verse to you, and we'll close with this. Acts 13, 38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. If you're looking for justification and forgiveness and salvation, Jesus is the only way. God sent his son to this planet to die on a cross for your sins and for mine so you never would have to climb up on that cross yourself. So you could have grace and forgiveness for your sins. Let's pray. If you're here today or listening online or the radio and have never given your life to Christ, we invite you to do it right now, not by raising a hand or standing up, not by walking a ladder, uh, an aisle or climbing a ladder. We invite you to do it by confessing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, by admitting you're not perfect, repenting of your sins, and crying out in faith for the grace that you need. If that's you, just pray with me. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would save me. I ask by faith that you would make me new and make me whole. Lord, I thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. Thank you for forgiving me for dying for me, for loving me. Father, as we close today, we are grateful for who you are, for what you've done. Lord, we're grateful that you sent your son to die for us so we could know what true grace is. Father, I pray that we would be a people who recognize the value of the law for what it is, but who don't strive to reach it. Father, I pray that we would be a people who recognize the value of grace for what it is and are grateful every single day that you reached it for us. Lord, we love you. We thank you and we ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.